Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. First, we must say something about the heart. It represents the core essence of what a man is. It is the seat of his intellect, mind, emotions, and will. Therefore, it is absurd to think a man can believe in Christ with his heart and it not have a radical effect on the rest of his life. Let's look at the language. Would you like to receive Jesus in your heart? What does that mean? What, have you ever thought about that? Believe in your heart, but we've changed it to, would you like to ask Him to come into your heart? Believe in your heart means to believe with the very core, the very essence of who you are. It doesn't mean you open up some secret chamber and ask Him to come in. It is the testimony of Scripture and the interpretation of all sound evangelical scholars that we are saved by faith alone. So why does Paul seem to add confession as a requirement of genuine conversion? Let's look at the text again. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul, throughout the entire book of Romans, has said salvation only by faith. So why is he now adding confession? Paul is not contradicting the doctrine of faith alone, but is teaching that our public confession of the Lordship of Jesus Christ is the evidence of believing in the heart. If someone is truly converted, they will publicly confess Christ in word and deed. That does not mean the same thing as presenting themselves before the church the night of their supposed conversion. If someone is truly converted, they will publicly confess Christ in word and deed. Why do I add word and deed? Because Matthew 7.21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who confesses me as Lord. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, I am not saying that we are saved by faith and works. Not at all. I am a grace preacher. What I'm saying is that salvation involves a lost doctrine. It's called regeneration. And that when God saves a man, he is regenerating his heart, turns him into a new creature, and the evidence is this, he will live like a new creature. And he will confess Christ. That is, the man who has truly believed in his heart, his life will be marked by a biblical confession of Christ in word and deed. You will be able to see with his, hear with his mouth and see with his life that his faith is a genuine saving faith. Now, I want to give you, I'm going to put this in a, I want to put this really quickly in a cultural perspective. Let's say that we're all a church, about 20 people, first century Roman Empire. You know from the epistle of Romans that these Christians are being put to death, some of them. They're dying like sheep. All right, now let's say that we have a, a, um, we're 20 of us, and we all work construction. So we're working on a, some kind of a building there in Rome. Construction, no problem, beautiful day. It's lunchtime, we're taking a break. Spring, we're laying out in the grass, having a good time, resting. And all of a sudden, though, we hear this. We hear drums. We look up and we see soldiers coming. And they're carrying a little altar. And on that altar is a little bowl of incense and a little fire built and we become terrified as all the construction guys come to their feet most of them unbelievers and there we are a little church in the midst of them the soldiers rally us all together and they say come forth pay homage to Caesar and so the first guy unbeliever goes up there and gets a little bit of incense throws it in the fire and says Caesar's Lord walks off as happy as he can be the next one and the next one and finally it comes to the first of us the Christians and one of us walk up Soldier prods him with a spear. Pay homage to Caesar. Jesus es in Kyrios. Jesus is Lord. And he dies. And the next one of us. Jesus is Lord. 
And he dies. And the next one of us. And we have taken that truth that Paul is teaching right here. That if you truly believe, you will confess Christ, even though it costs you your life. We have taken that beautiful truth and reduced it down. If you pray a little prayer before a bunch of people in a church in America, you can be guaranteed you're saved if you think you were sincere. That's not what it's talking about. Again... The moment a person calls upon Christ in faith, they are saved. But the evidence of salvation is not that one time in their life they were sincere when they prayed a prayer. The evidence of their salvation is, is there genuine repentance? Is there faith? And do those both evangelical graces continue on in their life and grow? In other words, the evidence of justification by faith is the ongoing work of sanctification through the Holy Spirit. Now, let's look at Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. First of all, this is not given in the context of a gospel invitation. Do you realize that? Christ is not knocking on the door of a sinner's heart. Nowhere does it say that. But he is knocking on the door of a wayward church. That's the context. This ought to raise some red flags for us. I said that to an evangelist one time, and he said, yeah, I know, Brother Paul, but it works. Secondly, I find it interesting that we use this text to give sinners the assurance that if they open up their hearts, Jesus will come in, even though this text does not specifically or primarily address conversion or the opening of a heart. On the other hand, we do not use Acts 16.14, which specifically and primarily speaks about both conversion and the opening of a heart. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Why don't we ever use that text? Thirdly, Instead of merely inviting the sinner to open up their lives, would it not also be appropriate to lovingly aid the sinner in self-examination to evaluate what the Lord might be doing at that moment? Do you have any sense that God is working in your heart this evening? Has there been an increase in your understanding of the gospel and the things of God? Are you more and more open to the person of Christ and the truth of Scripture and the demands of discipleship? Do you have a desire to respond to the things about which you have heard? To forsake confidence in self, in your life of sin, and trust in Christ alone? Fourthly, if we take this text, even if we do take it and use it for evangelism, if someone has opened the door of their life to Christ, notice this, the evidence will once again be ongoing fellowship. Because he said, if I come in, I will come in to dine with them. The evidence that a person has truly opened their life to Christ is continued fellowship with Christ. But is it not true? And don't tell me it's not. Countless millions of God, but they believe themselves converted because one time in one of our churches they prayed and asked Jesus to come in. That's true. Now let me share with you. I have... 45 seconds left. One of the greatest moments of my life was a few clicks south of Alaska. Some of you may have heard this story. But a man, as soon as I got up in the pulpit, about 25 people, a man walked in, giant of a man, saddest human being I've ever seen in my life, and he came and sat down on the front row. I immediately just stopped and started preaching the gospel. After I finished, I went down. I said, sir, what's wrong with you? What is wrong? He pulled out a manila envelope he just showed it to him and he said, I just came from the doctor. I'm going to die in three weeks. He said, I've lived out in the bush working on a working cattle ranch all my life. You can only get there by riding over the mountains or taking a float plane or something like that. He said, I've never been to a church in my life. I've never read a Bible. But one time I heard someone talking about a guy named Jesus. And, and I do believe there's a God. I've never been afraid of anything in my life. And I'm afraid because I'm going to die. And I don't know what to do. Now, I said, sir... For the last 45 minutes, I have preached the gospel to you. The good news of what God has done for sinners in Jesus Christ. Did you understand it? He said, yes. 
Now, what would have most evangelists done at that moment? Would you like to pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart? But this is what he said. Brother Paul, I understood it. I mean, anybody could have understood it. But is that it? Is that it? I understand it now and I pray a prayer and that's it? And I went and started explaining repentance and faith. And after several minutes, he looked at me and he says, I just don't get it. I said, look, you have three weeks of people because of our preaching. Walk around. They have no fellowship with Christ, no desire for godliness, no seeking of 